Okay, let's start. Uh, first, I briefly introduce myself. Um, my name is Dmitry Trofimov. I work for JetBrains. I am team lead and developer of PyCharm IDE. Uh, but today, uh, I won't uh, be speaking about PyCharm in this talk. If you want to discuss anything about PyCharm, come to JetBrains booth. Uh, PyCharm team will be there during all the conference, uh, ready to answer all your questions. Uh, don't be shy. Uh, mostly, um, uh, I develop in Java and Python. Uh, Java has been my primary development language for many years. Uh, and Python for me uh, is more than a language that I use. It's like a subject of constant investigation, like a snake that I examine, which type of scales it has, which teeth, and uh, what is inside of it, how to debug it, <coughs> how to profile it. And uh, also I'm curious about new programming languages. And uh, half a year ago I started to play with Rust a bit. Um, I knew nothing about it at that moment. Still, I don't know much about it now, but I hope that I will be able to introduce it to those who are not aware of it at all. By the way, who, ha who of you have heard about Rust? That's pretty much. And uh, how many of you have tried it already, developed some stuff? Oh, that's cool. Uh, for those who have tried it, it will be, I hope it will be also interesting because I will show some corner, corner cases. Yes, uh, so what is known about Rust? Um, uh, yes, and answering one more question. Uh, why, why did I pick Rust? Uh, why, why did I start to invest my time in learning it? Uh, it I found it interesting and uh, also I wanted to uh, develop a profiler for Python and to make it work fast. So, okay, I will tell about it. Uh, Rust, Rust is a Mozilla project. Um, and they actually are using it already for the new browser engine called Server. Uh, the project started in 2010 as a side project of Mozilla employee, Graydon Hoar. And uh, the version one was released uh, on May 15 this year. So now it is 1.1. And uh, before version one, uh, things were changing very, at very high pace in Rust, uh, breaking compatibility, um, and now it's still changing and standard library is not polished yet and ecosystem around it is just starting to emerge. But now it uh, has backward compatibility and this allows to develop production applications in Rust. So what is Rust? Uh, what did I uh, know about it when I started to, to learn it? Uh, what exactly captured my eye? Um, they told that it, it is fast, uh, prevents nearly all sick faults, guarantees thread safety, close to the metal, has zero cost abstractions, pattern matching, and type inference. And uh, that sounded very cool. I thought uh, it would be very interesting to learn it. Um, uh, first I started to listen to some talks on YouTube, nothing became clear from them, then I found some specification, it turned out that it is already outdated, the language ha had just changed, and then I found Rust book. Uh, for all of you who is interested, uh, I recommend this book, The Starting Point. It's online and very well written, and uh, I don't think that a talk can help you to teach the language. That's why today I won't explain uh, basics of Rust at all. I don't have a goal to teach you the language, but to give you a feeling of it. Okay, so let's start with a small uh, but real problem. And uh, as the Spears main advantage of Rust, uh, let it be a computational problem, like uh, computing primes. So uh, the problem is to compute prime numbers between two and n. And the prime number is the number that has no div divisors except itself and one, so like two, three, five, and so on. And uh, we will solve our problem with the help of an algorithm called the Rapotense sieve. Uh, algorithm is simple, they work with w this way. We first take all the numbers from two to n, uh, and then iteratively throw away those who have divisors. So something like that, we start to take two, and then we throw away all, all events, and then we proceed to the number three, we take as a prime, throw all uh, the multiples of three, and then it will be five, and all multiples of five are thrown away, and seven, and so on. So here we see a Python implementation of Arabathen's sieve. Uh, it's, uh, quite beautiful, isn't it? Uh, here we initialize our non-primes as an empty set, and then we iterate through a range, and uh, if the current number is not in that set, we increment our counter and update 
all the multiples. We put it into the set as a non-primes and then return it from the function. Okay, so let's run it. This is our function and also we have here main function which takes a common line argument as n and then it executes our function and prints output. Okay, so it's something like uh, okay, so we have four between two and ten, and for one hundred, we have something which seems to be correct. Okay, let's uh, measure the speed, the time of this program. We will comment out the output because it al al always slows down the execution. And okay, and for. One million. Oops. We make something like this one. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, more than half a second. So it's pretty fast. But uh, what if our uh, task is? What if we do care about speed? What if our task is to implement uh, the the algorithm uh, as efficient as possible? Uh, one of the uh, obvious solution, uh, solutions is um, to use C programming language because everyone knows that C is very fast and it's efficient and uh, very well, very good programs are written in C, for example, C Python is written in C. So uh, let's implement this algorithm in C. So the program now is a bit longer but it's pretty, pretty much the same. So we have our defense function. Uh, unfortunately, there is no uh, set in the standard, standard library of C, so we use an uh, array of primes, and we, where all uh, items mark as one, this means that it's prime, and when it's zero, it's not prime. And then we iterate through it, and if it's prime, we increment our counter, and uh, then uh, update all the multiples as zero, and then we put our array into the result structure. And unfortunately, there is no tuples in, in C, uh, so we need to have this uh, result structure, uh, which holds uh, a counter and um, our array. So, and here we execute it, and uh, we print the counter, and uh, then we want to print all the primes. We first uh, put them into the another array, which is the length of, of the counter. So we iterate again, we put them, and then we print them. So it uh, looks quite, quite similar. So we need to compile this. And we run it for 10, okay, it works correct. Now we run it for 100. Oops. And we have segmentation fault. Uh, anybody knows uh, where the, the, the error is? Yeah, I, I know that uh, it's difficult, uh, but uh, let's see. Uh, it it, it um, managed uh, to print the count of primes. So probably the error is somewhere here. Let's examine those lines again. So we have all primes uh, array, and uh, which is the length of the total primes, and then we iterate through our uh, first primes array, and if uh, the number is prime, we increment this counter and put it here. So probably we could think that we, ha we go out of range here, but it's impossible because we start from zero and we increment it with the same condition where we increment it here when this is true. So it shouldn't go out of the range. And here we just print the data out of the array. What, what is the problem? And actually that, that kind, kind of problem that, uh, that could be called like a beautiful journey in C because you have no idea what's going on. And uh, I'll tell you what is the problem. The problem is not here. The problem is here. Because uh, when we returned our primes array, 
we thought that we are returning an array, but actually what we do in C uh, is that we return the pointer to this array. So there's a pointer to array, it's not array itself. And array was uh, allocated at the beginning of the function on, on the stack. And actually it was valid only in the scope of the function. And when we, uh, after we uh, return the pointer to this array, and we go out of that scope, this array, it's, it's just no more. It has ceased to be. It, it expired and uh, gone to meet its maker. So, uh, and we still have a pointer to, to it. And uh, that is the problem uh, very common for C programmers so that's called uh, a dangling pointer. The pointer that points to nowhere, to some random, some random memory. And uh, uh, that's why we get, have a segmentation fault here. So, our task was to get our primes as fast as possible. Solution was implemented in C, but C is not a solution. I know that there are pro programs implemented in C, and probably there are people who are convenient with C and who know uh, how to use C efficiently, and probably um, they don't make such errors, but something uh, still tells me that sometimes they do. And I personally, after years of Java and Python, just can't imagine how to live in the world uh, where you can suddenly become a, a pointer to a random data in memory. So let's carry on to Rust finally. Let's implement the same in Rust. What we, will, what we will do now is just to re-implement our C program, but in Rust. And we will see how uh, Rust compiler handles this situation. So here we have our C program, and here we have uh, quite the same Rust program. If you don't understand little syntax details, it doesn't matter, because I just want you to, to understand one uh, basic concept. Uh, for example, uh, what we do here, we have the same structure, and actually it uh, denotes the same uh, as in C, we have counter, that is integer, and th this is the, the pointer, the pointer to array. So in, in there, there is no uh, pointers in Rust, but uh, this denotes like a, it's called slice in Rust. So it doesn't uh, hold the data, it doesn't hold the data, it just points to some data external for that structure. So it's actually the same as in C. And then here we allocate our vector, we initialize it, and we iterate, and we increment the counter, and then we do the same as in C, and here we return our vector as a slice. Okay, so let's compile that. Oops, I messed up with the typing. Yes, and we have compilation error. And Rust compiler tells us that primes does not live long enough. So what it tells us that exactly what we have here, that hey man, you cannot compile that. I won't allow you because you just want to return the pointer to the memory that will expire after we leave the context of this function. And uh, Actually, th this seems to be very strict, but what is better to get this error just in time before you run your program or to debug some mysterious segmentation fault just in the weeks after you deployed your program on the, uh, to, to your users, for example. 
I think this is much better. But let's, let's uh, run it. Let's make it work. We won't uh, fix this exact copy because it doesn't make sense. Instead of that, we just re-implement uh, it uh, from scratch in more idiomatic Rust because Rust has a uh, set uh, and it has tuples like Python, so we have much shorter solution and it resembles us Python. And uh, okay, let's run it. Okay, and for one million, something like, so yes, it's 20 milliseconds. So it's like 25 or 30 times faster than Python. And the concept that, that um, helped uh, Rust compiler to, to uh, deduce the error that we had uh, is called uh, lifetimes. And if you are interested about the, it, read Rust book. So, concluding our comparison, uh, Python is 25 times slower than Rust. And uh, C doesn't work just, but, uh, so Rust is fast and safe, but that is exactly what they told us in the beginning, nothing new. And returning to our main topic, can Rust make my Python shine? Yes, but if you search in the internet about communication between Rust and Python, you'll quickly find some tutorials about foreign function interfaces. You will even find examples like this. Uh, these examples are quite uh, clear and simple, and they work if you try. So this allows you to call Rust code from your Python code. But it's not enough. Uh, what if I want to access C Python internals from Rust? What if I want to convert Python string object to Rust string? What if I want to return a complex object from Rust? What, what if I want to make Rust library importable as a module in Python? And uh, actually, that is what is needed in real applications. Uh, for example, a Python profiler. By the way, how of you have ever used a profiler for Python? Yeah, that's cool. Mm, but for those of you who, who hadn't, uh, I'll tell what profiler is. Profiler is a program that measures uh, frequency and duration of function calls of another program. And uh, normally, the less overhead it has, the better. So let's make a Python profiler in Rust and to see how it goes. Actually, what, that was m my initial idea, idea when I started to experiment with Rust to try to make, for example, a simple, tiny Python profile. There are two major types of profilers, uh, tracing profilers and sampling profilers, also uh, called uh, statistical profilers. And uh, statistical profilers, uh, they periodically capture frames of running program. And normally it has less overhead than tracing profiler, which traces all calls in the program. Let's see how to implement statistical profiler in Rust. But here we won't go step by step implement all the program because we don't have so much time. We'll just focus on two important aspects and maybe we'll learn something all the way. And the aspects are periodically and frames. So how to run task periodically? There is no, no timer in Rust standard library yet, but uh, there is a wonderful library called Mio, Metal IO. Mio is a lightweight library providing effectively um, different uh, operational system abstractions like timing. And uh, we just create a event loop, uh, set up a timing event in it, and then we run a new thread and we pass the, our event handler and what is interesting here is an event handler. Our handler will capture frames and save them to statistics map. That is a sampler object that we create. It's called sampler. And as our timer works in a separate thread, that means that our sampler is a resource that is shared between 
different threads. Uh, so it's a shared uh, mutable resource, which is believed to be very dangerous. Uh, as everybody knows that uh, shared, shared mutable state is the root of all evil. But not in Rust. Rust guarantees you a, a safe shared mutable state, which sounds like a lie, but it's true. What we do is we just put our sampler into mutex, uh, a mutual exclusion primitive useful for protect, uh, protecting sh shared data. When you create a mutex, you transfer ownership of the data into the mutex, immediately giving up the access to it. And then any access to the data through the mutex will block threads uh, waiting for the log to become available, thus making the data accessible only through the through the mutex uh, by one thread at a time. And to pass the reference to another thread, we wrap it with the ARC. ARC provides reference counting through atomic operations. Uh, and it is also safe between threads. And having done all that, Rust compiler guarantees us that we won't have any race conditions. Never. It's just impossible. And not having done that, well, it, you can't access that object from different threads. A Rust compiler won't allow you uh, to do that. It won't allow you even to pass uh, this mutable data to another thread. So it will be on single thread usage only. So compiler guarantees you that you, your program will work. And to understand this better, um, read about ownership in Rust. So, capturing current frame. Um, for simplicity, we'll capture only uh, current uh, execution line, as we are not interested in, in call three at the moment. There are th three pieces of information, uh, file name, function name, and line number that we will collect at every tick of our timer. Uh, in Python, there is a function in module sys that is called current frame. Under the hood, it uses uh, function PyThread current frames. Looking uh, into the C Python internals, uh, we will find out that uh, the structure that we need uh, is called actually underscore frame. So we have this underscore frame structure that points to some, uh, to some PyCode object that we also need. And uh, what we need now, we, we need to conver convert it some, somehow uh, from, from C structure to Rust structure to be able to use it in Rust. And uh, that could be sometimes hard because uh, some C types are not very ob obvious how to map to Rust types. There is no, no, no uh, strict mapping, no direct mapping because uh, they are just absent in idiomatic Rust. So um, there are special Rust types for that, to fulfill that gap. Uh, for example, C void is analog of void, and uh, asterisk mute is a special type uh, that uh, uh, reflects uh, C pointers. And uh, normally there is null in Rust at all, but uh, to check this uh, row pointer, so we have special method is null. So knowing that, uh, we write our code and remember that uh, when uh, one tiny thing which, which is important uh, uh, when you're calling C function or using raw pointer Rust uh, can't guarantee safety anymore all such expressions should be within unsafe block and uh, I think uh, that is what they mean when they say that uh, Rust prevents nearly all sick faults because uh, that is the, the, the word nearly means that it doesn't prevent sick faults in unsafe blocks uh, when you work with C code. Um, so knowing these mappings, knowing how to use unsafe blocks, we just create our structures in Rust. And uh, seems that we are very close. Uh, uh, there is everything that what we need. But how to convert Python string to a Rust string? Funny, but that was nearly the hardest problem I faced because uh, actually it was difficult. And at some point I came up with something like this. So it's just to convert 
the Python string to the Rust string as the last line. And it, it, it did work sometimes. Uh, it didn't handle some differences between byte strings and Unicode strings, and I was already, uh, I, I already started to implement that, but uh, then I came across a library called Rust C Python by Daniel Grunwald, and my life became much more easier. That is a beautiful library, and I highly recommend it. Actually, it appeared that the, the most things that I needed to communicate Rust and Python uh, was there. I only needed to, to add some details for my specific case, and also it's a very good example of uh, Rust code. Uh, for example, the string conversion uh, using this library uh, looks like that, and also it handles uh, all the cases with uh, Unicode string representation, and also it provides very, very important abstractions like uh, uh, special log uh, corresponding to the global interpreter log in Python. Um, yes, and this is, uh, this is how you can expose your native uh, Rust library at the Python module uh, using uh, using the Rust macros. It's amazing, it's, uh, read the, the source, it's, it's very, very cool written. So it's uh, just this line, there are a lot of more under the hood, but, and they are very interesting. So, um, enough, it was much code, um, and much, very much details, but uh, I'm not finished yet. <laughs> uh, now, uh, if, as we have, uh, Couple of minutes, let's see how our profiler works. It's a stupid name. So, Python. So we're profiling this erlotens.py that we have written at the first time. Ah, okay, that, that's not interesting. We need to... Oops. Wow, I, th I thought that it will happen at some point. <laughs> it, it's impossible to, to make live demo without fails. Python, um, yeah, so... Uh, we comment out our print Python's name matter. Um, yeah, let's start with million. Okay, and this was fast. Let's make it for ten million. Okay, it, it's very simple now. It's very basic, but what what it tells us that. Uh, the 85% of our time went in the light 8, and 14% in the light 7, actually nearly 1% was for output of this line. So line 8 is this one. So what, what we are doing here is we are updating our set in array. And uh, what we are doing here, 15, 14%, is we are incrementing counter inside the array. It, it looks believable, so it looks very, very logical. Oh, yes. And if you still care about uh, performance in your Python applications, but you don't want to dig that deep into the native code, I recommend you to listen to the talk of my colleague, Katerina Tuzova, that will take place on uh, 23rd of July and Thursday. Uh, she will show you how to write performant uh, Python code without using any C or, or Rust. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Questions?
uh, is it possible to distribute uh, Rust code uh, as a Python package installed, which can be installed using pip? Uh, yes, I have came across a little library that uh, allows you easily to write your setup.py this way that it will uh, compile your Rust code if you have Rust compiler installed. Maybe it even downloads it, I don't know, I never tried it. Uh, I wanted to try it but had no time bef before. And uh, you just type setup setup.py build or install and it builds your Rust uh, from scratch. Like for C, setup Py allows you to install C extensions. So there is a library that allows it for Rust also. More questions? Yes, you said only one question. Yeah, that was a good question. Right, thank you again. Thank you.